600 meters. That's like six 100 meter running tracks. Now there's a better way to sum. The runway we're taking off from today, Morabin, okay, that's 1,200 meters. So that's twice as long. Taking off on a runway twice as long than the one which I've got to land. Now, okay, some of you experienced pilots out there might be fine with this, and a lot of you bush pilots, the people who fly in the outback, who like land on beaches and all sorts of awesome things like that, you guys will be fine. You'll be like, 600 meters, that's massive. But I don't fly a bush plane. I fly this quite high performance, fast SR22. And whilst it might like going high and fast, sometimes it doesn't like going slow and grass. So yeah, we're landing on a grass strip today, 600 meters. a short flight. The strip we're going to is only around 15 minutes away from here in Moravian. I'm actually going to go visit an old friend of mine. If you've watched the channel for a while, the person I'm going to go see today and the airplane that he flies, I reckon they'll be pretty familiar to you. Echo Yankee Zulu, how are you Michael? All good mate, was that you that just flew over? Uh, negative, I am five miles to you, uh, currently to your northeast at the moment. Aha, uh -huh. okay, no worries, got it. So, um, that, sorry, that was someone else, just by chance. Yeah, but look, absolutely, take your time, you know, do a circuit, have a good look at it, but uh, I think you'll be happy when you get here. But anyway, we'll um, stand by. Yeah, let me do a circuit. I'll do a right-hand circuit for uh, two, three, and then uh, I'll let you know on downwind what I'm going to do. Yep, and just remember, absolutely no pressure. Just, uh, you know, make sure you're comfortable. Yeah, roger that. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. All else fails. I know Avalon very well. I can get a cab from there. All right, well, there's the airfield. Terrain ahead. Pull up. 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 Well, that terrain boarding isn't doing. Echo Yankee Zulu, sudden fun. Echo Yankee Zulu, go ahead. Uh, how are you feeling? Yeah, I feel all right. Those trees are pretty tall at the end, but uh, I was high on that one, and uh, I'm going to try another one, and uh, yeah, see how we go. But yeah, I'll give it a go. Caution, under speed. Done. Michael, how hey, are mate. you? I told you watching this as we were coming in that I was going to meet someone you would recognise if you've watched the channel. Last time we spoke, and I think the last video we put together was your round the world trip. Oh yeah, that would make sense. A little bit pensive coming in here because it's the first grass strip I've landed Echo Yankee Zulu on. But it was actually fine. You, it's actually you, quite a long distance you've you, got you, here. You were pulled up by halfway, yeah. yeah. So we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a quick chat. The other thing that you'll probably recognise if you have watched the previous video with Michael is the other, the real star of the story. Let's be honest, <laughs> no one wants to see us, it's the planes. It's right over here. Yeah, she's the one who did it. <laughs> This 
story that we want to tell you about, this starts almost exactly a hundred years ago. Almost exactly. <laughs> so sorry. Because uh, almost a hundred years ago, the Australian government, they set up something called the Great Air Race. And the idea was to see if it was possible to fly an aircraft from the UK to Australia. Prime Minister Billy Hughes, um, his challenge was the first Australians to fly a British aeroplane. Mm. So it was all very parochial. Back to Australia, it would win £10,000. So Keith and Ross Smith, two brothers, settled on a Vickers Vimy, which was a bomber from World War II. Uh, it actually went on to be the first plane to cross the Atlantic and it was a quite a suitable plane. It was a twin engine, quite large, but it was an open cockpit. They weren't the first plane to leave, but others crashed. Unfortunately, a few people died, but they ended up being the first ones to make it all the way back to Australia. They landed on December the 10th in Darwin. But one of the most interesting things on that flight is not only did they manage to fly all the way to Australia, but as they left England, Someone handed them a bag of mail and said, now if you get to Darwin, pop this in the post. <laughs> so that became the first air mail to actually come to Australia. Ah, I didn't know that part. It was not just a big news in Australia, it was big news all around the world. Uh, and I've got something to show you. Have you? Yes. Oh, you've got so, props. This is the March 1921 National Geographic. And this trip was such a big deal that the entire issue is dedicated to this trip. I'm going to retrace this trip, mm. uh, picking up a new plane soon, uh, the new Southern Sun, and I'll fly out of London, and not only will I uh, follow the route, but I'll take as many of the same photos that they did it that I can. Michael's recreating this leg, so it's not just us standing here. Oh yes, that's true. Yeah, that was just, <laughs> which is huge. We don't want to like underplay that component. So Michael will be flying from London back to Australia. I was going to say again, but you haven't, have you done it that way before? No, you went no, from Australia out I, to London, yeah, so you've so done it the other way. Yeah, so the first time I've flown eastbound. Another part of this story is where you come in. Uh, the mm. Wrigley, Wrigley and Murphy were two aviators who set out from Point Cook to meet the Smith brothers when they landed in Darwin. You're going to retrace that flight. That's my part of this whole yeah. exercise. So whilst the Smith brothers were flying down and arriving in Darwin on December the 10th, Wrigley and Murphy who were flying up, which is the flight that I'll be recreating, they were flying from Point Cook in Melbourne, which is only about 25 miles in that direction, up to Darwin to help kind of assess potential landing sites, the best routes that should be taken, and just kind of almost breaking the ground for the Smith brothers and everyone to fly then on from Darwin the idea is, oh, it's, I hope you're playing <laughs> along at home. So I fly from Point Cook over a couple of days up to Darwin, meet Michael when he arrives there on December the 10th, and then there's another leg. But I reckon let's save that one because there's a big event that's going to be announced in the future around retracing that trip. Mm. But uh, Can you tell he works in the film industry? <laughs> Do you like that cliffhanger? That was very nicely done. <laughs> well, you're taller than me. It'll work better if, if you're downhill. Small. I have to really hold my hand. That's as wide as I can. Unless... You want the table? Let's do the table again. Now, flying up to Darwin in December, any of you who know a little bit about Australia and aviation and maybe especially meteorology know, that's wet season. Have you got any tips? Well, look what I found on the way home on my circumnavigation. I was flying through that part of the world uh, quite late in the season. But the thing about those storms, you get lots of cells but you can see them very clearly ahead. What I tend to find up in that part of the world is you're more likely to see the cells you know, off in the distant and you'll, you know, you'll see some big nasty stuff, but you kind of see it coming and you can either go and you know, land somewhere or often just divert you know, mm. 10, 15 miles around it. So my advice would be have plenty of fuel. What are some of the things that you have to contend with with your flight then? So you're going, you're covering much greater distances than I am. The longest leg I'll be doing is about 1200 miles. So that's not mm. too bad. Uh, that's shorter than what I had to do with Southern Sun. And also, I was going to say, what was the longest you did in this? Oh, um, 1,600 nautical miles. Just 1,600 nautical miles. Just think about that for a second. Well, 1,600 is... At 80 knots. <laughs> <laughs> Any other tips from a seasoned pilot? Well, look, seeing you land in a couple of hundred metres on a grass strip tells me that you've got that side of the plane down but you know I think the long flights are an interesting one so you know first thing you need to get yourself a red bottle um, and then I notice you don't have an opening window so you might need a bigger bottle <laughs> take lots of small snacks that you can eat along the way so that you feel comfortable and be patient you know the great advice that Burke me is the legendary um, uh, Grumman pilot out in the Aleutian Islands you know he said to me uh, just just be patient if uh, if you have to stop for two or three days, you'll get there, you know, people fly, commercial pilots fly all over the world in bad areas 
uh, all year round mm. but they just have to be patient so apply that patience and you know don't if you're going to be late it doesn't matter push on the nose push on the nose yeah and hang the chalk just on the um like so push backwards on the nose yes, Nice and, you, and you are the first visitor uh, the first to visitor. Rothwell Airstrip. Do I get a badge or something or a, a plaque? How about you sign the hangar? I can sign the hangar. Yeah, let's right, do that. I'll do that next time <laughs> I come back. Um, see you in Darwin. Okay, see you on the 10th.